that fair housing would in our time become the unchallenged law of this land. When President Lyndon B. Johnson declared the 1968 Fair Housing Act the unchallenged law of the land, he didn't foresee that the law would ultimately fail to communicate effective housing reform due to cultural bias, disempowering legislation, partisan politics, and legislative loopholes. After the Civil War, American culture continued prejudices that reflected a racist view of blacks. Blacks were seen as foolish, lazy, and lascivious. Popular minstrel advertisements from the 1830s to the 1920s portrayed blacks with enormous grins and clown-like faces. The rise of cinematography in the 1920s and the following decades created movies that furthered these communications. Another common stereotype was that blacks were violent. Cartoonists communicated this idea as they asserted that the civil rights movement was handicapped by lawlessness, rioting, and looting, and that their violence was comparable to that of the Ku Klux Klan, a highly violent group that lynched innocent blacks. Hollywood also promoted this view of blacks in cartoons. Because of such negative communications about black people, most white communities did not want black people to integrate into their neighborhoods. Meanwhile, white neighborhoods that did welcome blacks remained segregated, as blacks could not often afford to live there. Even by 1950, the median annual income of black families was 54% of the average for white families. This was because black workers were highly concentrated in occupations characterized by lower job stability and by lower wages in general. In the 1950 census, laborers and service workers, two historically unstable and low-paying jobs, accounted for more than half of all employed black workers. In contrast, less than one-fifth of white workers were so employed. In fact, a 1937 issue of a Washington, D.C. newspaper contended that sharecropping, a form of farm labor, was the only profession under which a black person in the South could maintain himself. This was because blacks had never had access to the amount of schooling that whites had. Enslaved blacks were prohibited from obtaining educations, while free blacks attended segregated schools with inferior funding. In 1915, the South Carolina public school system spent an average of over eight times more on white children than on black children. The results of these inequalities had become very evident by 1950, as black persons, aged 25 and over, had completed three years less schooling than the average for white persons. Many black people that managed to save enough money to move away from these inequalities moved to the north, but realtors there often took advantage of black migrators by demanding unreasonably inflated interest rates and requiring large down payments on houses. This robbed black people of the ability to buy decent houses in white neighborhoods, regardless of whether the white community would accept them. The Fair Housing Act, which was created by the Federal Housing Administration, was meant to prohibit discrimination in the sale of housing based on race. But the aforementioned prejudices prevented the FHA from effectively communicating its purpose. The Federal Housing Administration, a program that was founded in 1934 to help citizens after the Great Depression, communicated its goals to help housing be more readily available but their legislation initially did not benefit low-income families or racial minorities due to the use of covenant and disproportionately rated mortgages. Neighborhoods with a large population of people of color were deemed too risky to secure government-backed mortgages, which led to the concentration of minorities in urban areas. The Federal Housing Administration's underwriting manual from 1936 publicly stated that banks and private builders should investigate areas surrounding the location to determine whether incompatible racial and social groups were present, which meant that minorities had no chance of getting into suburban neighborhoods. The Housing Administration reinforced ideas such as covenants because they prevented blacks from moving into integrated neighborhoods, and integration would take away the income they made by giving black people unreasonable interest rates and large down payments. The Federal Housing Administration advocated for these practices regardless of them being declared unenforceable in 1948. They were also able to inspire a continuation of racist practices which led to the segregation in housing. For example, the passing of the GI Bill in 1944 made many white realtors fear that returning black veterans would use public sympathy to advocate against racist ideals. Similar to the Federal Housing Administration, the GI Bill exploited the use of interest rates and large down payments for profit, so the prospect of the FHA put the realtor's income at risk. After World War II, 40% of black veterans weren't discharged honorably at an exceedingly higher percentage than their white counterparts. These discharges denied veterans benefits that the GI Bill provided in relation to buying houses in the suburbs. Its effects were evident in the 1950 census in which there was a 152.1% increase of non-white people in urban areas. 
the FHA, which was created by the Federal Housing Administration, provided positive solutions for minorities in the U.S. Riots, which had sprung up after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, were resolved after this act was passed. MLK's activism was heavily focused on an open housing market for black people, so the passage of the bill eight days after MLK's death caused the bill to be seen as a response to a grieving and enraged America. When the Fair Housing Act passed, the cheer went up from the packed galleries as Speaker John W. McCormack announced the vote. This bipartisan vote started to create peace and unity after years of tense discussion and protests for justice. Because of this, the Fair Housing Act started a new trend in government to favor equality and the protection of minorities in housing and mortgage lending. Although the 1968 Fair Housing Act looked promising, there were many limitations, making it almost ineffective for black people attempting to buy a house. First of all, the bill only provided protections against overt discrimination. Redlining neighborhoods was prohibited, letting blacks move into any neighborhood of their choice. However, there was nothing stopping real estate contractors to disempower minority home buyers by only recommending low-income neighborhoods. This loophole practice was permitted because of a racist housing market that believed blacks would bring down home values through violence. Alternatively, black homeowners who recognized this problem could sue for discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. Yet the McDonnell Douglas v. Green cases in 1973 set new, difficult criteria to file a complaint. These new conditions were too specific to be effective for most black homeowners because of the financial and mental toll of going to court, so realtors were rarely reprimanded for their actions. These miscommunications of the law between the government, realtors, and the general public limited the effect of the 1968 Fair Housing Act, providing an unstable environment for black people to integrate into neighborhoods. The Housing and Urban Development Act was a government program that was meant to further fair housing, but failed as it was limited by the government opposition. For instance, Nixon, the second president that oversaw the HUD, stated, I'm convinced that while legal segregation is totally wrong, that forced integration of housing is wrong. The HUD was also underfunded, so they could not perform many needed tasks like assessing discriminatory claims and data on housing, restricting the ability of the HUD to desegregate neighborhoods. This loophole kept black home ownership and housing wealth at the same rate since the 60s. The authors of the 1968 Fair Housing Act miscommunicated their definition of housing prejudice because the act did not specify whether unintentional bias should be counted as discrimination. This is why, in 2013, former President Obama signed the Disparate Impact Rule, which added a ban on disguised housing discrimination to the Fair Housing Act. Critics of the rule claim that businesses would be subject to great amounts of undeserved legal liability and that it should remain the blacks' responsibility to prove disparate impact. The Supreme Court agreed with this claim when Justice Anthony Kennedy ruled a disparate impact claim that relies on a statistical disparity must fail if the plaintiff cannot point to a defendant's policy causing that disparity. While President Obama's administration was checked, they continued to communicate change. Another miscommunication of the 1968 FHA was the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, or AFFH, clause. According to the HUD's Preserving Neighborhood and Community Choice Rule, passed in July of 2020, the 1968 Fair Housing Act requires HUD grantees to certify that they will affirmatively further fair housing. This unclear phrase made it difficult for the government to know how to enforce the law. In July of 2015, Obama's Housing Secretary, Julian Castro, communicated a new AFFH rule to clarify enforcement. This obligated HUD grantees to complete a 92-question form about how segregation and poverty correlated with each other. If local governments could not prove that they had executed a desegregation plan, the federal government could deny developers access to housing funds. Critics believed Obama's AFFH rule was too cumbersome to enforce on local communities. Dr. Ben Carson, the former secretary of the HUD, agreed with critics, stating that Washington has no business dictating what is best to meet your local community's unique needs. Supporters of the critics likewise argued that the federal government can't dictate what happens in local communities. Former President Donald Trump went on to suspend Obama's AFFH rule. While the Democrats and Republicans debate the scope of governmental authority, inequalities in black housing remain due to cultural bias, disempowering legislation, partisan politics, and legislative loopholes. Various lobbying groups, news agencies, and government studies have reported the presence of unequal housing wealth and integration. The need for communication is still vital and ever-present if Americans are to achieve their dreams of equality, justice, and a better 